Hey everybody, it's Annalisa with Journey to the Goddess TV, where I regenerate ancient feminine wisdom for modern women. Welcome to today's episode, How to Honor the Feminine with Barbara Joy Laffey, PhD. So before we get into the video, I'm just going to remind you that if you liked this video, please hit like, please subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, check out all the other videos on the channel, and feel free to share this video if it resonates with you and you think it will resonate with anyone else in your life. A brief introduction about Barbara Joy before we get into the interview. Barbara Joy utilizes a depth psychological approach to explore what it means to honor the feminine in the inner and outer worlds within a patriarchal culture. She trained in counseling and group process facilitation at the Toronto Institute for Self-Healing and received her PhD in depth psychology at Pacifica Graduate Institute. Barbara Joy is an award-winning glass artist and a film and television producer, and she considers herself a shamelessly addicted student of popular culture. Thank you everyone for being here and I hope you enjoy our conversation. Welcome, Barbara Joy. Thanks, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have you. When we first met, I was very inspired by the presentation that you gave, and I asked you to, uh, if you would be interested in interviewing with me here on Journey to the Goddess TV. And since then, I've had a, the, the the honor of reading your manuscript, your memoir called Missing Parts. And I've also had the opportunity to read your uh, doctoral thesis, Honoring the Feminine, the Path to a Conscious Ma Masculine. And, and in this, you are dialoguing with your memoir and um, reflecting on your own journey to personal healing and honoring the feminine within yourself and how you've helped bring that out into the world and help others do the same. Before before we really get into some of these questions about your life and your work, I would love to ground our interview by talking about the feminine. So if you could let us know what the feminine is and also what the feminine is not from your perspective. Sure. So the idea of the feminine as an inner aspect, I think began with Jung, who identified the anima in men as their soul, their feminine aspect of themselves. And he identified in women what he called an animus or a masculine aspect. And because these aspects were unconscious, they were projected onto their partners or their others. That concept served really well for a while, but because Jung identified the anima as soul and women didn't have an anima, there was this concept that maybe women <laughs> didn't have a soul or that women were carrying the soul for men. Marion Woodman really brought Jung's work in this regard into the present day. She renamed Anima Anonymous as masculine and feminine. And she identified that both men and women have masculine and feminine aspects to their inner selves. These aren't the only aspects we have in our inner selves. We have inner children, we have inner witches, we have inner tricksters, we have inner wise elders, and we have inner masculine and inner feminine aspects that we can relate to and dialogue with that can, that can show up in our active imaginations or our dreams in character form. Um, so the Chinese would call it a yin and yang aspect. I identify the feminine as receptive um, dark, juicy, warm, non-linear. I would identify the masculine aspects as active, logical, um, thinking versus feeling on the feminine side. Um, the feminine would, would carry our wisdom and the masculine would carry our doingness. And when we experience a masculine and a feminine in harmony and in connectedness with each other, we find that the masculine can take action based on the wisdom that the feminine has identified. This brings up something that I struggle with. And that is when we talk about these terms, the feminine and the masculine, because I've read your work and I know that you've talked about the feminine and masculine, yes, as, as, as both as inside of each of us, uh, and also how it's not, it's not gendered. Like it's, it doesn't right. necessarily mean that the feminine equals 
woman or women. And I still struggle with that because I feel like what's happening in the culture and what happens for even a lot of people that study this work is they still get confused and they, you know, associate the feminine with women specifically. And we both know that that's especially problematic because of the way, well, okay, I'll speak for myself. I know that that's problematic <laughs> because of the way that women and and qualities attributed to women for thousands of years have been degraded, demonized, right, and devalued. So I, I feel this inner conflict of, you know, both wanting to uh, maybe change the word the feminine so it's more neutral so that people don't necessarily associate it with women, but at the same time, we need there needs to be a, a dual healing in our culture. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm, I'm wondering kind of what your thoughts are on, on that inner conflict. If you've ever had that inner conflict, you know, I haven't personally had that conflict with the languaging, but I see it in authors writing when they're talking about the feminine in a man, in a woman, in a non-gendered or binary gendered person. And then they, shift sometimes even within the same sentence to speaking about women mm -hmm. when they're speaking about the feminine and it is a challenge in our culture and it is a challenge because we are in a patriarchal culture and for thousands and thousands of years the feminine has been conflated with weakness the shadow sides of the feminine have been projected onto women deviousness weakness, you know, non-direct. So think about the witches who carried all the shadow projections yeah. of the men right? who projected their power onto these women who were strong, who were healers, who were intuitive, mm -hmm. who were spiritual. And one of the things that's happened in our culture is that by conflating the shadow sides of femininity with women, it has helped the patriarchal culture persist with men holding power and associating the shadow sides of masculinity with men. Women can carry positive aspects of masculinity, rationality, logical thinking, um, the ability to create a good spreadsheet or run a business, you know? Oh, yeah. Getting things done on time with a schedule, I consider masculine qualities. Yeah. But then the balance with for the feminine side is nonlinear thinking, thinking outside the box, creative thinking, flow and movement, um, being non-rational. Right. You know, where the scientists who who come up with a solution for a decades long problem when they're in the shower and a flash of insight come or it shows up in a dream. Right. The shadow sides of the masculine which you know have been called macho or toxic masculinity are very present in our culture now too. Right. So yeah. it is problematic that feminine is equated with women and masculine is equated with men. And people who do that then act that out in the way they treat men and treat women, assuming women don't have a logical side or assuming men can't flow or be wise. Yeah. And it is a challenge for our culture and you can language it differently. Uh, you, as I said, yin and yang are non for the West, non-gendered terms, but they still refer to the same things. That languaging works for me. Some people have used the idea of solar and lunar, but I have a little problem with that. Lunar light is reflected solar light. So there's, it's a little bit lesser. Yeah. Not in not in alchemy and alchemy solar and lunar are equal, but in right. astronomy, solar light is reflected by the moon. And I'm even thinking, you know, there are even some traditions in which the goddess is the sun and right. like the god is the moon. So it's a different way of thinking about sun and moon and feminine and masculine. And even just in different languages where there are gendered nouns in different languages, the sun will often be a feminine Right. word and the moon will be a masculine word so it's important to look at these as inner aspects of the self among many inner aspects of the self and for me in my life in my personal growth and in my healing work 
it's been incredibly valuable and instructive to connect with the feminine and the masculine, to dialogue with both of them, and to learn how to privilege the feminine as a counterbalance to the privileging of the masculine that we live in, in this culture, in our everyday lives. I want to go back to something you uh, spoke to, and that is the concept of toxic masculinity, which does get talked about quite a bit in our culture, and much less so a concept of toxic femininity. And I'm wondering if if you have something, insights on maybe both of the, what is toxic masculinity, what is toxic femininity in relationship to this idea of the feminine and the masculine? Never heard the phrase toxic femininity before. So the idea of toxic masculinity is, is really that our patriarchal culture has moved into valuing shadow masculine qualities, ungrounded power, rape culture, chopping down all the trees in the forest. In order to rape the land, you have to disconnect from nature. In order to rape a woman, you have to disconnect from your own body. So that is masculinity would be, and, and that can be women that can carry that, right? Women can chop down all the trees, practice sexual abuse, harassment, assault. That's not limited to just men. But the idea of toxic masculinity is that those shadow aspects of masculine qualities have come to power in our culture and have resulted in inequality, lack of diversity, lack of respect for indigenous uh, peoples, elders, lack of respect for anything that reflects the feminine and tries to power over. So to ask about toxic femininity would be to ask about the shadow sides of the feminine. And there's a phrase I used when I was writing my uh, dissertation, you know, the fear of honoring the feminine is that you will have so much fun wallowing in the mud that you'll just stay there. I think the equivalent would be inactivity, lethargy, you know, non-movement, disconnectedness from the masculine to the degree that there is no forward progress, that there's just, just a wallowing. Yeah, I'm seeing like this kind of inertia and this inward kind of collapsing. Yes, navel gazing. Which our culture is really good at. It's hard to be conscious all the time. Now on to your memoir. I was really struck by how much I saw myself in your story and I think that other women will probably see their own lives and their own patterns in your story too of the way that we um, you know self-sabotage in our relationships to men, devalue our bodies, you know, especially you know the where we're at in the culture right now is it's like it's valued to be promiscu- sexually promiscuous for men and women and so when i read your story what i saw is that i have not been honoring my feminine my inner feminine so my question is how does one learn to honor the feminine you packed a whole lot into that question well, let's unpack it a little bit so it is culturally acceptable to be very sexually active these days i grew up in the 60s and 70s when women could newly and suddenly access birth control. And so there was an opportunity to be more sexually active than before. Although there are a lot of people who say everybody was always sexually active anyway, and there were just more abortions and out of wedlock pregnancies. And I don't have a value judgment about sexual activity. My focus is on being connected within the body and the soul. And if your body and soul is fed by sexual activity, sexuality as sport, sexuality as joy and delight, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just fine. But if your sexuality is, as mine was as a young woman, based around neediness, wanting to be liked, telling myself it was love because I didn't wanna be alone, giving away my body, and shoving down the inner promptings and inner guidance and inner wisdom that might've said, this isn't such a good idea with this particular person 
at this particular time. That was problematic. And I went through a lengthy journey, many, many years, you know, to come to conscious awareness of my body from the perspective of my sexuality, but also from the perspective of medical situations. Our bodies never lie to us. Our bodies always tell us the truth. The trick is we have to be willing to listen and we have to be willing to honor what they say and not discount. And sometimes what our bodies tell us is not what we want to hear. You know, there's a story I wrote in my dissertation. It's all in my memoir as well about a relationship I had with a man, I guess for a couple of years, lovely relationship, lovely man, long distance relationship. We'd get together and, you know, spend long weekends together. And then we split up many years later, we found ourselves both living in Los Angeles and we started dating again, but something in the middle had changed. I had been through a huge long process of coming to a different relationship with my own sexuality. And I had come to make a commitment to myself to not have sex outside of marriage. And I had told him that, and he was fine with that, you know? And so we would go on these dates and then we would come back to my apartment but of course, we'd had a previous sexual relationship. So we would sit on the couch and we would get all hot and bothered and we would kiss and hug and snuggle. And, and then I would like say, stop. It was incredibly frustrating for both of us. And one of my therapist friend counselors who I talked to about this said, you know, you've, you've drawn this artificial line in the sand. Like I'd really been honoring my inner feminine wisdom to not pursue a sexual relationship again without a proper container for it. And I had labeled that container as marriage. And she said, maybe that container isn't marriage. Maybe it's something else. What happens if you remove the line in the sand and you actually just listen to your body consciously? And so the next time we found ourselves on the couch in my apartment, necking and hugging and kissing and getting all hot and bothered, I tuned into my body and said, what, what, what's going on and what do I need? And my body gave me this image of him sitting in the chair on the other side of the room. I cracked up. It, I was laughing. It was so funny. <laughs> he wasn't so thrilled about that. You know, I said, I'm listening to my body. My body says, you need to sit over there. And I don't know how long you need to sit over there. I don't know if it's for 10 minutes or the next six months, you know, but that's what I need now. And, you know, we had a lovely evening. I made tea, we made small talk and he didn't ask me out again. And that was fine. Right. I had no regrets because that sense of wholeness in hearing the message of my body and seeing this image of him sitting in the chair across the room and just this laughter, this delightful laughter that came up to me and how silly it was, you know, my willingness to honor that message and say, okay, you need to sit over there. So we're not taught that. Exactly. And what struck, struck me when I was reading it, but more so now while we're talking about it, is that sometimes you following your body's needs, it might not always be what you want to hear, but it's also not always what other people want to hear. I'm going through some life lessons around that right now. It's very hard, but I think at the end of the day, I, <laughs> it's more rewarding and uh, will feel a lot better. You know, this is something that Marion Woodman wrote about in her memoir, Bone, when she was being treated for cancer. And going through the process of trying to listen to her body, but not really trusting her body because her body had gotten cancer, right. you know, and her body hadn't told her she had cancer. So right. how could she trust her body? Yeah. But if she couldn't trust her body, what could she trust? And when I went through cervical cancer, I didn't know to trust my body. I was very young. It's in my early thirties. And I put all my trust in the doctors and that's what we do. If, if there's an authority figure wearing a white coat, an authority figure managing our money, an authority figure managing our legal situation, an authority figure wearing a police uniform, we put our trust into them because our culture has taught us to. Right. And if we are pleasers, which women have been taught to be, but men do this too, then we discount those inner urgings. We discount that inner voice. And after a while, that inner voice goes silent. And I think one of the big challenges for people today of all genders is to reconnect with that inner voice, with that inner wisdom. You asked earlier, how do I connect with my inner feminine? There are a lot of ways. You, you connect by feeling your feelings, by encouraging that inner voice to speak, and by listening to what it has to say, by tuning into your heart, by 
being in the body. Body doesn't lie. Our feelings are real. And all of this is inner communication. And how do we learn how to do that? I don't know that we can do that by ourselves. I, I learned how to do that in group situations and therapy situations. Focusing work is, is really powerful. Dyads, dialogues, groups. Right. Active imaginations. Absolutely. Dream work, journaling, dancing, authentic movement. You know, Marion Woodman used to dance in her bedroom every morning when she got up. And then she would journal. You have this beautiful quote. And when you talk about the feminine, the, how your feminine hides away deep in the underworld realms, far below the basement, where she might stay for as long as it would take until I am able to create a safe and welcoming world where she could be heard and honored. When I read that, something triggered in me, my own memory in deciding to go to Pacifica. And I had this experience with Anana in a meditation and she took me down into this cavernous space. And I was also able to identify the layers and it was like the bowels of mother earth, the bowels within my own body. And she told me that at some point, the feminine, including her as the representation of the feminine, had to go deep into hiding, deep into the bowels here in our own bowels and all the different layers of bowels. Uh, for self-preservation so that the patriarchy didn't distort the feminine forever. And so that was a really profound moment that stuck with me and, you know, is still with me and now through my doctoral process. And I think on some level is what got me writing about menstruation in the first place and reclaiming menstruation as life affirming and powerful. And so that image of the feminine of you putting of you um, somehow hiding away your feminine inside yourself in the basement in the underworld, me having my own experience of that, and then reflecting on my work with menstruation, then had me reflect again, on your own menarchal experience that you talk about in your memoir. Do you feel that our, that women's experiences of embodied femininity somehow get shoved down into the basement? So Marion Woodman spoke and wrote a lot about the feminine hidden in the layers beneath the basement, the bird in the cage. She saw a lot of that in women's dreams when she was uh, practicing in her analytic practice. I cannot say that I made any conscious choice to put my feminine down below where she would be safe. That's just where she went. If I were to anthropomorphize the feminine and call it her and gender the feminine as a her being. I think that children are born whole and the culture changes every one of us. And a lot of our work is to come back to that wholeness. A lot of the ways that we, you know, depth psychology is, is the psychology of the soul, but it's also the psychology of the culture. And, and the ways that we heal the culture is by healing our souls. And so when the culture causes us to hide our light, hide our beauty, hide our wisdom, because it's not safe, then our work in our lifetime is to make it safe so that our light, our beauty, our wisdom can come out. And I think for many of us, that's been a lifelong journey. And in this culture, particularly in our Western patriarchal culture, the body has not been valued. The body of the human, the body of women and men, the body of the earth has not been valued. I've been reading Carolyn Merchant's The Death of Nature. And I know you write about it in your dissertation too. And I was really struck in her writings about about the connection between Francis Bacon, the father of modern science, and the um, Inquisition and the witch trials, and yeah. that parallel, right, between you know him borrowing language from the inquisitors and how he talks about investigating and extracting from nature, and how that language is still, and that paradigm is still with us today. Yeah, here in Washington state, there is now legal approval for the Navy to practice their combat missions in our state parks. So when I wanna go uh, for a hike on the trail and, and end up at the beach, 
I might encounter Navy SEALs doing exercises with weapons. So that there is a disconnection in that military focus from the purpose of those parks as soul nurturance. They've been protected from having the trees chopped down and the ground dug up, but they're still not protected from this military activity. It's disappointing, actually, considering where we live. And considering how conscientious and green-oriented Washington State normally is. So that that's an example of how you can see in everyday life the need to honor the body mm-hmm. and what happens when we don't. Whether that's our personal body in a sexual relationship where we're not listening to the inner cues and we develop vaginal infections, or in my case, cervical cancer, you know, or rape, not to blame the victim of any of those experiences. But when we're disconnected from our bodies, we're not whole. And when we're not whole, things fall apart. And the body will continue to try to speak to you in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. The voice gets quieter when you don't listen, and it's harder and harder to connect with it. For me now, that voice is speaking all the time. (laughs) So annoying. (laughs) You're like, what? Turn there. No, I don't want to turn there. Turn there. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So I'm really curious to hear you kind of talk more about your experience with what I'm calling kind of this archetypal feminine wound. I was in a conversation recently with a friend of mine and we were talking about what sometimes gets called the feminine wound. And I, you know, I know I follow a lot of feminist conversations. So there's, you know, there's a lot of anger and angst that some women have toward men and patriarchal culture. And we were talking about this and I, and I just had this sense, I was like, I feel like below the anger is this deep sense of betrayal. From what I understand in history, you know, for thousands and thousands and tens and thousands of years, it is very likely that, you know, men and women, everybody in between, we were all partners. We were in this, what Ryan Eisler talks about, the partnership model, because we had to work together to survive as communities, or not had to, but that's what we were doing. And so, and then something changed in history and you know we have this development of patriarchy and this degradation of women and the feminine and the earth all starts you know it's mainly what happens and so for me i've started what that feels like is this deep betrayal like how how we were partners how could this happen how could you do this to us this is the first time i'm actually verbalizing it so explicitly other than just using the word betrayal And I wonder if that's actually that deep sadness, that grief, that the betrayal, these different feelings underneath the anger is is what is actually happening in this kind of archetypal feminine wound. And so when I read in your memoir, your experience of being in that group setting or there's something coming up for you around your father. And, and or this deep anger and it, it eventually expressed itself as anger towards your father and you were able to physicalize it to let it out and then all this other deeper stuff came up and you were talking about you know this anger toward men collectively for all of the rapes and the cuttings and it was so explicitly moving to read that I felt it so deeply in my core that that is what's underneath for me under that feeling of betrayal and I have so much love for men anyway but that feel that still feels like a betrayal and so I'm what I would love is for you to either talk about that experience that you had or talk about what those deep feelings of of anger that uh, and, and that came up for you sure so I read Rian Eisler differently I read Rian Eisler as proposing the partnership culture for the future, mm. coming out of a patriarchal culture. And I disagree with her about that because I don't think you can have a pendulum that was a matrilineal world and then a patrilineal world, and then oh, it stops in the middle mm. at this balanced partnership. I think a pendulum has to kind of 
find its way toward the center. Uh -huh. And this is why I propose that, no, I'm not looking for a partnership of equivalency between masculine and feminine. I'm proposing we must privilege the feminine, not women, the feminine within all humans as a first step toward that rebalancing, that the masculine serves the feminine, that feminine wisdom is what the masculine can take a stand on behalf of. It's interesting that you're talking about betrayal because I just attended a dissertation defense by Lisa Flatiger, another Pacifica student who did a profound dissertation on betrayal and her healing path through using active imagination and authentic movement. I don't know how to identify the, the phrase archetypal feminine wound. That's not something I would know how to say or define, but I do think that there is a lot of anger and rage and that we spend a tremendous amount of energy holding it down because we need to be civilized and we need to not murder people or destroy our environment. And the huge amount of energy that we use to hold it down causes us to live at a level of depression because our energy is, is focused on this subjugating rather than unexpressing. And I think it's really, really important that emotions be expressed safely in ways that don't injure ourselves or anyone else. So for me, I learned to express anger by pounding on pillows in a group circle. It was mortifying and embarrassing and I'd never seen anybody do that before and I wanted to leave the room and, and then it became a really powerful tool for me. Writing out the anger, not putting in an envelope with a stamp to mail it, that's you're injuring someone else, but writing it out, letting your pen make holes in the paper. You know, I wrote in my memoir an instance of slicing up my ex's clothes with my Swiss Army knife. One of the most joyful experiences of my life, but it was a deep expression of my anger. So yes, there is a, there is a cultural betrayal of our humanity. And Gerda Lerner writes this so amazingly in, in her creation of patriarchy, in, ha in women having become the property of men. I firmly believe that we are smaller because we were bred that way. Mm. You know, I don't believe we started smaller. A smaller woman would be easier for a man to control. So that would be the woman that he would choose rather than the larger woman who would be his equal. So I just think that was a breeding selection. That's my belief. I have no data to back it up whatsoever. Yeah but that's kind of how I see it. That we live in a culture that doesn't value women. And this is where that crossover happens between the inner feminine and women. Yeah. We live in a culture that doesn't value women, also doesn't value feminine qualities in women or men. I believe that the level of anger and rage in men as a result of the damage done to them by patriarchy mm -hmm. is even worse mm -hmm. than it is in women because it's okay for us to talk about it. And it has not been okay for men to talk about it, but they are beaten up if they cry when they're kids, they're told to man up. So I don't see that anger and rage and betrayal of, of the feminine aspects or of the humanity or of the heart as an archetypal feminine wound. I see it as a humanity wound of everyone in our culture. And I see the healing as, the deep listening and the willingness to protect that voice that has been so silenced that says this is wrong. And the deep listening comes, yes, in listening to yourself and to your feelings and to your body and also deep listening of the other. Sure. Absolutely. I'm not in this alone and the togetherness in, in a group situation or, or a therapeutic situation you know, the, there is that patriarchal ideal of the, the solo individual who is, is a hero and has a hero's journey. I don't know that the concept of the hero's journey serve us, serves us. I don't think so. I mean, it seems to be like born out of patriarchal consciousness anyway. And that our journey is to, is to quest on our own and to prevail and to find helpers when we need them and conquer the adversary. And, you know, maybe our healing journey isn't to conquer the adversary. Maybe the healing journey is to embrace the adversary and realize the adversary is 
within ourselves and is, is a valuable part of ourselves. I think this would be probably a good uh, segue into talking about the inner marriage and how, kind of, as your as the title of your dissertation basically says, honoring the feminine, the path towards a conscious masculine. So let me tell the story of where that idea came from. Okay, great. <laughs> so I was living in Los Angeles. I was engaging with Marion Woodman whenever she came to town to work on this film project that never got off the ground, but was a great excuse to hang out together. <laughs> And she was leading a workshop at Pacifica before Pacifica had a campus. I believe it was the Miramar Beach Resort on the beach in Santa Barbara. And she was co-leading this workshop with Robert Johnson and it was on masculinity. And it started Friday night and went through Saturday and they would take turns. Marion would speak and then Robert would come up and they would dialogue. And then Robert would speak and then Marion would come up and they would dialogue. And this happened all weekend and Sunday morning, Marion spoke. And then the time for the dialogue happened and there was no Robert anywhere to be found. And people went to the cottage he was staying in and people talked about how he had said he was going to be traveling to India right after the workshop. And they wondered if he'd left for the airport already and he wasn't there. And it was quite discombobulating. You know, here we are in this, in this hotel ballroom with, I don't know, 150 people at this workshop. And this is the concluding session and Robert is supposed to join Marion and there's no Robert. And Marion did a really wonderful job of kind of, okay, he's not here, we'll, we'll carry on. And she took questions. And I do want to say that he did eventually show up like an hour later and it was closing time of the conference. And he basically apologized and said that he got the time mixed up when he was supposed to be there, lost track, went for a beach walk, lost track of time. And there he was, you know, not there. And then there too late. And I was driving her back to LA after the workshop that day and taking her to the airport. So, you know, she took all the questions and then she signed all the autographs. And then we finally got in the car and we're driving down the Pacific coast highway. And we were kind of just reflecting on the weekend and the day. And I said, you know, I really, you handled that so well when he didn't show up you filled in for Robert, you know, you got the whole thing closed out. You did a great job, but can you just tell me what you were really thinking? What were you really thinking? when he wasn't there. And immediately, without hesitation, without a moment to think, she said, oh no, not again. And I was like, oh no, not again. Robert has done this before. And she said, no, no. Oh no, not again. The masculine isn't present. And so I asked what she meant by that. And it really developed into this conversation for the whole rest of our drive down to LA about how the masculine, the conscious masculine isn't present in our culture. And I experienced that in my life, that this masculine energy, this doing this, here I was in Los Angeles trying to produce films, getting nowhere, you know, struggling to pitch, struggling to get my work out there. And I didn't have a lot of masculine energy to cause things to happen. I didn't know how to do that. And so I said, well, I think the masculine's missing in my life. And, and, you know, what do you do about that? It's missing in the culture. It's missing in my life. And she said, the only way I know to engage the masculine is by going deeper in the feminine. And I had never heard anything like that before. I'd studied enough with her that I knew what the feminine was. And this idea that if I went deeper into the feminine, if I went deeper into my feelings, if I went deeper into my body, if I centered down, that would be the way to engage the masculine as opposed to, I don't know, flailing about out here from my head, Right. make, make a list, make a spreadsheet, give myself <laughs> a schedule, beat myself up, yeah. <laughs> say affirmations in the mirror. So I really took that to heart, that phrase, the only way to engage the masculine is to go deeper in the feminine. And so when I found myself at different times in my life where I needed to engage a doing this that wasn't there, and I've allowed myself to go deeper in to the feminine, what I found was guidance on what direction that masculine needed to take. So the unconscious masculine is trying to be out there doing stuff without the, the guidance, the groundedness, the directed from the feminine. And that doing of stuff doesn't accomplish much. But when we can go deep inside to the feelings, the heart, the body, the soul, 
go, this is what's needed. Then the masculine has something that sort of discernment can come out and cut away what's not needed and take action for what is needed. It's like activated by the life, the life force wisdom of the feminine. Right. So I also, I experimented with this also with my outer relationships. I am heterosexual. So my outer relationships are with men. So when my outer male wasn't there for me, instead of going banging on the door and saying, why are you not there for me? I need you to show up. What I would do is go deeper inside myself, deeper into my feminine and discover my truth. And then that masculine would, would be there. How would going into your deeper feminine, go, going more deeply into your feminine in that way also affect your inner masculine? So the inner masculine then has something to, to do what it loves to do, which is to do stuff. Yeah. And it has something to do stuff for. Right. It has a mission. So I find that really interesting that going deeper into the feminine not only engages the inner masculine, but somehow, however you see it, whether it's energetically or what have you, engages the outer masculine too. That's right. And that is my personal experience. And I am not an expert on the quantum physics and the zero point field and all of that that says when we change in here, it changes out there. Eleanor Dixon's writing a wonderful book about all of that okay. right now that I had the privilege of reading an early draft of. All I can say is from my experience that does happen, that the partners in our lives, and I won't say men, I'll say the partners, because I think this is, applies for men in their path with women and applies for women in their path with women partners, all genders with all gender relationships. Our partners cannot partner us if we are not partnering ourselves. It's really that simple. And it's friendships too. It doesn't even need to be intimate partnerships. Right. 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 So that's the the value of the inner inner marriage. I'm I'm like making sure I'm not saying sacred marriage. That's because I I read the whole different concept of the sacred marriage and the alchemical marriage and the golden child all of that. This inner marriage that I talk about is a little more mundane than that. It's really just When the feminine is engaged, the masculine can show up. And then whatever comes out of that comes out of a place of wholeness and connectedness. So from this, from your life's work, from your life's experiences, working with honoring the feminine to engage the masculine to the path of a conscious masculine, you've now taken that work out into the world and you're helping others do the same. And I think what's most impressive is is the work, well, it's all impressive. Okay, it's all impressive. <laughs> <laughs> However, what seems vital, absolutely vital and nurturing is the work that you're doing with teenagers and kids and schools. And you know, I was able to look at the links you sent me and the, you know, the school programs that you're working with. So I'm wondering if you could talk about your work with, the, with these teenagers uh, and why it's important to work with kids. So I think that I, I had such a hard time as a teenager myself that I just didn't want anyone else to have that experience. When I began my work at the Toronto Institute for Self-Healing, I was leading a women's group. I was working with a partner to lead a couples group. And I started a group for teens. And I just loved working with teens for a number of reasons. First, because of my own challenging path. But also, they learn so fast. They don't have decades of baggage that you have to work your way through. And they share what they've learned with their friends. You have a group of five or six kids And that it just goes out. It happens quickly. It happens easily. They don't have to go deep, deep, deep down to that feminine that was buried below the sub-basement, locked in the the cage, because they haven't lived long enough to bury it that far deep. So it's incredibly rewarding to work with them and to also help them learn some of these principles early on that will help to inform them for the rest of their lives. And you know what I really loved about the story that you tell in your dissertation about that specific group of kids you worked with? There was something really important about doing the work in a group setting so that, for example, these young boys 
could hear the stories that the girls yeah. and they could feel the impact that it had on them and then they could get in touch i guess with their own inner feminine and and masculine in that way in just that deep listening so it was a really powerful experience i was facilitating this group of teenagers in toronto they would come to my home and we would sit in a circle and they would share and it was boys and girls 15 16 14 and one of the girls one day shared the story of how she had been date raped and she had a boyfriend and they were going with another couple out to the beach. And when they got out to the beach, he raped her. And when she shared the story, and of course everybody was terribly engaged and sad for her and feeling it. She said, the thing was that she knew that she should never gotten on that. He drove a Harley and, and she, you know, the black leather and all that. She said she knew she shouldn't have gotten on that bike. Something inside told her not to get on that bike. But she shoved it aside because it wouldn't look cool to the boyfriend and to the other couple. She didn't want to not look cool. So she shoved aside that inner guidance that told her not to go. And she went and she experienced being raped. Now, this story was told to me more than 30 years ago before I did any of this work. I mean, I'd learned to do some of my anger work, but I, I sure hadn't had that conversation with Marion yet. And she shared this story in the group and it was kind of like dominoes. Many of the other girls in the group began sharing other stories of date rape or of assault or of narrowly missed assault. And each one of them, when they told the story could pinpoint a moment when some inner voice, inner guidance, some bodily sensation, you know, that physical fear response, something had told them not to go, not to do whatever, get off the bus here. And they had ignored it. And the consequences had been horrible for all of them. So we talked about how it was the cool thing to listen to that voice and to take care of yourself and to honor that guidance that you were getting. But what was really profound for me was there were three boys in that group and they were devastated. I don't think they'd ever heard a, a girl talk about being raped. And I don't know what their experiences in their dating life had been, whether, whether they'd been aggressive sexually with their partners. They were pretty silent as all these girls were sharing. And then one of them, he was in tears. You know, he spoke up and he said, I'm, I'm, horrified that that happened. I'm so sorry that that happened. You know, you're, you're my sisters. And those are my brothers that did that to you. And I'm just going to say right now today that I am never, ever, ever going to be aggressive with a woman again, ever again. And the other boys agreed and they kind of took this pact. They kind of made like a promise it just arose spontaneously in the circle that they would have more respect for their partners. And then I asked the girls to make a similar pact among themselves, to have that respect for themselves and to listen to that, to that voice. It was powerful. I, I heard you tell that story previously. I read it. I'm hearing it yeah. again. And each time I'm just... I know. I get chills every time I tell that story. It was such an instructive moment. And it seems to exemplify exactly what we were talking about a few moments ago about going deeply into the feminine allows a woman in this example to engage the masculine and that shows the outer masculine to show up differently and help him in this case men get in touch with their inner feminine as well yeah they felt the feelings you know he had tears coming down his face he was in his feelings you know and they they were horrified to hear this story so in the outer world girls shared their pain and the stories of this assault. And in the outer world, these boys stood up and said, I will defend you. I will protect you. I not only will I never do it, but I won't, I won't support anyone else doing it. So there's the outer world reflection of the inner process that he, he embodied, you know, they just, they were telling their stories, yeah. but he embodied it because he felt his feelings for them and he felt his love for them and his caring for them. And out of that love and caring for them came his 
commitment. Thank so that was the intermarriage in him. So that was 30 years ago, but you've continued to do this kind of work with, with kids. Yeah. In different forms. That was the last time I led a group of teens, but I've been part of mentoring organizations and I've mentored a number of teens through the years. And now I've been involved with the coaching boys into men and athletes as leaders programs here in Washington state. Well, they're all around the country actually, which is in school athletic programs, teaching respect in relationships and non assault <laughs> techniques. And also dealing with bullying and name calling and shaming body shaming. And how are kids showing up? How is it coming across? What are you seeing? You know, the programs that I've been working to institute here on Whidbey Island got put on hold when the pandemic began. We were just ready to have the athletic directors and coaches start some training. So I haven't witnessed that personally, but if you go to those websites, Coaching Boys into Men and Athletes as Leaders, there are videos of other schools that have engaged and the kids really love it. They buy into it and they share it with their friends. I will leave links in the yeah, YouTube text that'd box. That'd be great. And so you also work with the Sophia Institute. The Sophia Center for Transformative Learning is a teaching collective that Laura Lee Scott began a few years ago. And I taught a course there last year, just an online program on honoring the feminine on this material. I had a plan to also teach it in person which is put on hold, but well, again, and Laura Lee's asked me if I'd like to teach that class again, which I would love to. So this spring or early summer, we haven't set a date yet. So I want to suggest some more resources. One of the organizations that I think is doing extraordinary work with different language is the Gender Equity and Reconciliation International, which was founded by Will Keepen and Cynthia Bricks. They are doing small group process, deep process work to heal the gender divide. So the groups are mixed and they have done some for trans and non-gendered as well. They're doing this work all around the world. They have groups in India and in Africa and Australia, all around the States and Canada. The book that they wrote called Divine Duality, it's very similar to the process of work I did train in at the Toronto Institute for Self-Healing. I think that it is powerful, profound, meaningful work and it's available everywhere, just about these workshops and their website and videos. And they've had to move online with the work, but I did attend one of their workshops and, and so I can acknowledge and recommend it very highly. I also think that people who are less interested in doing group work can, can look at focusing because focusing is psychotherapy work that, that relates into the felt sense in the body. Mm -hmm. Feeling into the felt sense in the body helps you get in touch with the body, authentic movement. Right. And I know like people could actually go to the Marion Woodman Foundation, right? Aren't there classes? They have workshops and retreats, the uh, body soul rhythms work that she pioneered. I also want to give you the opportunity now just to talk about anything that I didn't ask, but that you feel is really important with regard to honoring the feminine or your work and or your life? We haven't used the word soul very much, but I, I do believe that connecting with the feminine is, is connecting with the soul and that to heal ourselves and the planet and our culture, we need to make room for soul. When you think of soul, what, is, what does soul mean to you? How does that look? How does that feel? Well, to me, soul is being. It's just the beingness of who I am and it is interconnected with yours and everyone else's yeah it takes courage to live a different way it does it does yeah it takes a lot of courage it gets easier <laughs> because you do it and then you get a result and you go oh that worked and then you do it again and then it you develop that foundation of trust in yourself. Mm -hmm. you know, instead of trusting the doctors or the boyfriend or whatever, you develop that um, trust in yourself. Right. Based in that deep listening, that honoring the yeah. feminine. Yeah. Because that inner voice never lies. I you know. I'm just thinking right now because there's something about courage, I think, in a culture that gets attributed to masculine qualities. Bravery. Bravery, right? And so there's something about giving it maybe both a, f a feminine quality and a masculine quality or something. There's like, 
the root word of courage is cur, which is heart. Courage comes is based in the heart. That strength comes from being based in the heart. And where the inner marriage comes in, when you go into the what is below, you process out that shame, you'll find the heart. You process out that anger, you'll find the humanity. Process out that fear, and you'll find the courage. It was really fascinating. I never liked my name, Barbara. There were a whole bunch of Barbaras in my generation. I remember walking into a second grade, maybe fifth grade class, and there were five of us, and I just didn't like that. And there were stories afoot that I might have been called Roberta or Rebecca or whatever, and Barbara was the compromise. And one summer when I had begun this healing journey and was was really doing my own deep work at the Institute for Self-Healing in Toronto, I went on a canoe trip with some friends up in Northern Ontario. And I said, this summer, I'm going to find myself a new name. And I wasn't sure what it was. I had a therapist that I was seeing and she came in one day and said, I have to tell you something, I'm pregnant and I'm going to be taking a leave. And because I had been through the trauma of the hysterectomy and wanting children and not having them, she felt this would be a trigger for me. And so she said, we have a few months before I leave that you can process this. And I kind of put it out of my mind and didn't really think about it. And I was doing all this great work at the Institute. And then I would come into my sessions with her and share about that. And then the next time I came to see her, I was like, oh, I'm supposed to tell her how I feel about this pregnancy. And I was driving to her office and I thought, okay, well, I'll go into my body while I'm driving. and I'll see what I feel about this. And I felt this thing like a life inside of me. I felt this thing like a funny feeling in my legs this funny feeling in my body. And when I got into my session with her, I told her, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I did what you asked and I'm feeling into this and I have this weird feeling. And so she told me to close my eyes and we'll go into my body and see what it felt like. And it felt like I was pregnant. So she asked me a bunch of questions like, well, who was the father, you know, and when did this happen? She didn't say, oh, you're having a hysterical pregnancy or, oh, you're having a psychotic episode. She didn't label it. She just kind of went with it. And I could pinpoint the moment that conception happened because I'd I'd had this conversation with a friend and the conversation had kind of gotten very magical and starlit and spiritual. And there was this connectedness. I was like, that's the moment of conception. He's the father. I wonder how he'll think about that. And when was it due? And, and I had this whole, this whole construct of a pregnancy that was going to be, I think, nine weeks instead of nine months. And I went to see the, the friend and I told him I was having this weird experience and he was the father. And, and he jumped up and went into the kitchen and came back with pickles and ice cream. <laughs> and it was just this, this game that was going on for me to have this experience. Getting toward the end of it, I was feeling very sluggish. <laughs> Loaded. Quite strange. Yeah, incredible. Still seeing the therapist every week. And we were having, we were scheduled to have a big party at this yoga studio where we used to have our groups. This father uh, and I were, were partners in, in facilitating this group. And uh, we were having a big party with, you know, music and food and disco lighting. And I had a godfather and a godmother all picked out and they were part of that group work and they were there. And I went through this birth experience, started feeling something odd and and left the room where the party was going on and went into the other room and went through this really weird birth experience. The result of which was that I felt this, this thing that I had literally felt inside of me for nine weeks. I felt it kind of melt and permeate my body. And it had this feeling of warm apricot nectar, golden juice Mm. that went all through my body Mm. and just lit me up. And what came out of that was that I had given birth to myself and my name was Joy. It was really powerful. It's joy filling for me, the listener. Like I have a visceral experience of that 
joy just feeling that moment. Well, you know, so so many years ago now, and I adopted the name I had at that time, I had like five friends whose names were Joy and I was freelancing in the film business. And the last thing you want to do when you're freelancing is change your name. So that's why I went with Barbara Joy instead of just completely changing it to Joy. And that has worked very well for me. But my friend who was the father in this case came into the room just after I'd had this experience. And I said, I think my new name is Joy. And he said, well, let's test it out. And so he he said, you walk around the room that way and I'll walk around the room this way. And so we walked around the room and as we passed, he said, hi. And I said, hi. And then we went around the room again. And the next time we passed, he said, hi, Joy. And my whole body just went, (laughs) you know, it's odd to share profoundly deep personal spiritual process experiences because it all sounds incredibly woo woo. But for me, these were real moments of my life that changed my life. And they don't feel woo-woo at all. To me, they feel quite profound. And that really does come through in your writing. Thank you. You talk about it so sincerely and you're so grounded in the way that you speak about it and contain it that it it feels real. One of the things that I've thought about my work and my writing and my teaching in many of the ways that Marion Woodman was able to take Jung's work and give it new language and translate it in some ways and put her own take on it. I feel like a translator. I feel like I can take Marion's work and others and put it into kind of everyday language that teenagers can understand that it doesn't have to be this academic voice with research and methodologies and epistemologies and that it, one of the gifts I have is, is to be a translator and to take those ideas and concepts and put them into everyday language. I also want to give you an opportunity to let people know where they can find out more about your work and your classes. Um, at this point in time? So I don't have a website yet. I'm working on getting my memoir published. If you know any agents and publishers that would be interested, that would help. So my writings are posted uh, on academia, pacifica.academia.edu slash Barbara Laffey. And my classes are at the moment through the sophiacenter.com. And I'm going to post links to all of that again. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. You are a wonderful interviewer and it's really been fun. Thank you so much. And it's been fun for me and I'm glad we finally got together. Thank you everybody so much for joining us. If you like what you saw, please hit like, please subscribe to the channel. Please leave a comment. I have a Patreon page. If you'd like to find out more ways that you can support the channel, then go to the link below in the text box. I'm also on Clubhouse now, this new social media app talking about goddesses every Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific time. And until next time, thank you so much. Ciao.